This is Bob Victor's sort of suggestion that everybody knows when we're going to meet and when we're not going to meet. Well, this is all tonight. It's going to be all introductory, and it's going to be all preparatory, and it is going to be all stage setting, and we're going to say almost nothing of any value tonight. <laughs> it's true. I'm... Next week we'll make up for it. We'll try. Next time we meet, we'll we'll make up for it and try to work very very hard. This is part of a uh, series of talks on modern mysticism. Well, uh huh. Sorry, door is closed. <laughs> going to make me hungry again. Oh, it's for me. I see. <laughs> this was, what is this here? All right. These are talks on modern mysticism. And the uh, word mysticism comes from the word mista or miste. And the, uh, it, that comes from the uh, ancient Greek ceremonies celebrating the myth of Demeter and Persephone. And these mysteries were celebrated in a suburb of Athens called Elysius. And from that they have become to be called the Ellicinian Mysteries. The word mista literally means veiled. That is covered with a veil. The miste were the candidates of the first degree to the Ellicinian Mysteries. They were called hearers of the truth because they were not yet ready for direct experience of the truth and so they could only hear it as part of their preparation and part of their purification and part of their spiritual cleansing. The second degree of the mysteries, the general mysteries at uh, Elysius were called the epopte. who were seers of the truth. Uh, so we have a mysticism class because we're all still veiled yet, uh, and because we probably couldn't pronounce epoptism. <laughs> it would be too difficult. This is a very common uh, uh, distinction in all mystery schools. I have the door open. That isn't going to make a difference. She's going to fly out. Okay. Uh, that is the difference between the hearers of the word and the seers of the word. Some lived by hearsay, but even still the words were inspirational enough and were leading enough that it brought them to the truth so that they could see for themselves or they could... Uh, break through the veil and see into the world of light and see the true realities. The interesting thing is that in later mystery schools, modern mystery schools of our times, Christian mystery schools, the seers of the truth are not as deep as the hearers of the truth. Uh, because the seers of the truth see the light in the desire world, 
which is quite an accomplishment compared to uh, our meager experience in the material world. But the hearers of the truth had the truth sung to them from the archetypes of the world of thought. And it was like a direct apperception of the word radiating right into their being. For this reason, if you look at the opening uh, passages of St. Luke's Gospel, which is a gospel of feeling and of emotion and of desire, uh, it, is, it says outright that this gospel, which means in the uh, spiritual sense, this book of initiation is for seers of the truth. Or in the opening chapters of St. John's Gospel, it says this, this gospel is for hearers of the truth. And it doesn't have all of the emotion. It certainly doesn't have all of the pictures that are presented in Luke's Gospel, but instead it has the very, very deep uh, philosophical content that is in some ways more Greek than it is uh, uh, Jewish. In another sense, in the general sense, the word mystic means someone whose approach to life is from the inside out as opposed to a materialist. A materialist looks at things from the outside in and believes that the basis of meaning is to be found in material objects and that everything else is relevant to the material and the material is the ultimate source of truth. The mystic believes there is one who comes from the point of view that the ultimate source of truth is spiritual and from within, and that uh, it is in following the impulse of the spirit out into the material world that the world begins to make sense. This is the most general uh, use of the word mystic. A second definition of the word mystic is to differentiate it from an occultist or occultist. A, an occultist does things by knowledge and by works, whereas the mystic in this sense of the word does things by feeling and by belief or in general by faith. This is a fundamental division of humanity that there are some people who are believers and feelers of the truth, and there are some people who are doers and thinkers of the truth. It's something that was tried to be unified by the activity of Christ, but even in the early church, if you read through the letters of the various apostles, you'll find that there is a distinct a rivalry between uh, uh, those who are think that faith is all one needs without works and those who say that one cannot attain to spirituality without works. We find it even right now in the late 20th century, uh, Christian mystics of the inclination like myself, uh, somewhat thoughtful and occult, believe that we have to do something. But if you, for example, uh, meet uh, people who are called Jesus people, what you run into is people that know all you need is faith, that uh, works aren't necessary and works are, in fact, even a distraction. We won't so much be using that sense of the word mystic, but a mystic in the uh, most specific sense is one who is a candidate for studying the mysteries. The mystery schools are schools that claim to teach truth and claim to teach truth in such a way that one can live it. This is a very strange and a very strong claim. In some ways, they claim they have not a corner but a pipeline to the truth. It's almost a myth itself. The mystery schools trace themselves back into early Atlantean times 
when gods walked among humans and that people from the planet Mercury who were themselves retarded in their development came and helped us because we were even more retarded in our development and gave us the means to catch up and even move ahead of the schedule of the path of initiation uh, or the path of evolution through initiation. And so the mystery schools then helped people who were losing their inward sense of consciousness and becoming more and more involved in matter and in so doing becoming more selfish and more lost from their spiritual roots. The mystery schools were used to help people get in touch with what is going on. The mysteries have uh, changed as humanity has changed and, ha and has and have changed as our evolution has changed. In general, in our times, the questions that answers are given to in the mystery schools are, what is a human? Or what is the nature of the existence in which we live? Or what is our relationship to the divine how did we come to be this way? Where are we headed? How can we better participate in this process? And all of the many, many whys behind all of the things in the world. In this century, or in this class I should say, we're really going to be drawing a lot from mystery schools and the ideas of mysticism in that sense and always be looking at these very basic questions. The, in our times, the mystery schools have been primarily involved with two activities, teaching us to harmonize with ourself and with the world by learning to love more. That all of the great spiritual teachers in history have not so much focused on science or on art or on any major intellectual discipline. All of them have put their primary emphasis on the spiritual and moral evolution. The development of that part in which we are weakest and which is most essential for our becoming true human beings, and that is to love. And so the emphasis in the modern mysteries is on love, and since it is for children of fire, the secondary emphasis is on participating and actively taking part in the evolution, which means service. So love and service are the primary watchwords of modern mysticism, and we're going to try and do a lot of that. Uh, it won't sound that way tonight, but I do have something of an intellectual mental character, and so the talks are going to suffer a bit of that, and the intent, though, is to bring us to our hearts. A good reason for attending these talks, it may sound very silly, is that in the development of these talk, talks, I put everything I have to go into subjects as deep and rare and lofty as I can. And I think that is the service we share together that maybe one night every other week that we can think about very high things and be inspired by thinking about high things and uh, getting away from our very mundane lives and getting a sense of what we were intended to be and what is behind all of these things. So it's a kind of practicality that is meant to take us away from the humdrum. Right now, the talks on mysticism for the last seven years, or this is actually the seventh year, have been 
on folklore and mythology. And the general series has been called Mythology and the Mysteries. There have been a number of sub-series. This year we're starting a whole new one. The first sub-series was very short, in, and in it we discussed how the mysteries look at mythology. The mysteries see mythology as the language of the spirit, the language that our soul nature lives through. That is to say, the mysteries look at myths, all myths, as allegories, but in most cases, almost literal. The, each of the myths has within it many, many sides and many, many interpretations which are just like the nature of spirit, which is universal and has so many facets that it's very hard to contain it in anything, in any vehicle. And mythology represents a language or a story language that we can get at that truth. The uh, whole idea of what we're trying to do is to drop the husks of the story and get into the moral or into the life of the story itself. This is what uh, all of our endeavor is. Otherwise, our lives here, if we only take the material things of our lives as beautiful as they are, enjoyable as they are, they're relatively meaningless. And we can get all caught up in all kinds of materialism. And so that's what we're trying to get away from. See, we're almost done with the talk already. This is going to be a 20-minute, uh, easy, easy living kind of talk. And uh, uh, after that, we made a correction and said that sometimes uh, when one gets into the meaning of a story, one finds out that it is sometimes a mirror image or a negative image, and it means just the opposite of what it says on the surface, but we pa we'll pass on that. After that, we tried to get at fundamental ideas, how the divine creates in ideas. And to do that, we looked at creation myths. And in the creation myths, we tried to draw out formulae. And out of those formulae, we tried to understand universal principles or universal ideas so that we could use them for anything from... Uh, Oh, I don't know, making a recipe for a cake to uh, putting together a, an, an organization like a school or whatever one is doing, that within the creation myths are the basic formulae for the creation of the universe. And we finally, that first year, we had a three sub-series, and we ended up the year talking about myths used by the mystery schools because we tried to be in touch with what the mystery schools do. We looked at Isis and Osiris. We looked at Demeter and Persephone. And we looked at Dionysus, Zagreus, and uh, Bacchus, and finally ended up with Orpheus. And we examined the mysteries themselves, and we uh, looked at different keys, such as astronomy and physiology, and numerology, we looked at various keys to the mysteries, and then we took one, uh, one myth and looked at it on various levels of depth. All right, we're getting through all of this very quickly. Run, run, run. Uh, then we took an entire year studying, meeting every week, as a matter of fact, studying myths and folk tales of heroes and heroines. We try to understand the hero as the spiritual initiate, one who was overcoming the various trials and temptations in ourselves, which themselves represent stages in the involution and evolution into and out of the material worlds. And each of those stages itself involved the principle. 
Something like in music, when something resolves from one key to another, uh, or like in chemistry, when something goes from uh, one state to another state, that each of those critical changing points represents a trial or it represents a change in consciousness and a change in experience. And what we have evolved through to become what we are, we have to undo that and in undoing it, transform it into creativity. And that's what we looked at with initiation. And then finally, we spent three whole years looking at mythology and hierarchy. We looked first at Hinduism, then we looked at uh, Egyptian myths, then at Greek myths, and finally at Northern European myths. And we tried to understand what was more important than other things. Priority. What is more important? What is less important? And why? And in last year, we uh, looked at myths of triangles. We tried to understand the spirit which is most simply manifested in a principle of triangulation. All right. Now we're looking at, for the rest of the year, myths on the origin of evil. I don't know if we're going to get everything said this year, and I don't know if we're going to go two years or not. But if you have a favorite myth or one that is very perplexing to you about any aspect of evil, its origin or its ending, or having to uh, struggle with it in any which way, I would love to incorporate it into the, uh, into the uh, class. We'll probably, I think, might end up going two years on this. The real objective of the class is to share what we experience in trying to find the good and live it. Which is a really ironic thing because we all think we know what the good is but it is very hard to verbalize, and in some cases, even much harder to live out. It's very much like St. Paul says in the Bible, the good that I would, I do not, and that which I would not, that do I. It's not an easy thing to be as loving or as helpful and kind or to do the right thing like we always like to do. And... Uh, I want to examine that. Why is it that we have such a fascination with evil, and what does it mean? Because it is the paradoxical opposite. Any understanding that I have ever looked into of evil is totally irrational. Evil is stupid. There is no, you know, you can say it in very simple terms. It's stupid. But strangely enough, in psychology and in spiritual studies, a tremendous amount of thought goes into rationalizing evil and trying to understand something that is basically irrational. And that very thing itself is one of the things I want to, want to look at why we spend so much time uh, focusing on it and uh, rationalizing it. It's something very, very deep, and there are all kinds of twists and turns in it. And uh, we'll try to look at it from as many ways as possible. What we're going to begin with, uh, probably for three or four meetings anyway, we're going to look into the Garden of Eden, Eden story. We're going to go right back to the Adam and Eve story and the origin of evil as it is seen in uh, uh, Judeo-Christian terms. And there's a lot of things in there. I've been, well, I've been at it for quite a while and <laughs> I'm not anywhere near finished. After that, we're going to look at the uh, 
another uh, Eastern European or Mid-Eastern variation, we're going to look at the myth of Prometheus and Pandora and uh, see the variation that is a little bit different there. And then my intent is to go to the Vedas, the Puranas, the Brahmanas, uh, the Upanishads, and the Mahabharat for uh, taking out some excerpts on the subject, especially where uh, Brahma emanates good and evil from his body. And uh, that one will have musical accompaniment as Ela grits her teeth for a while. <laughs> always a trial for Eula's love for me to go into uh, Indian myths and, <laughs> and she says, you make them so much like they aren't. <laughs> and following from the thread of uh, Brahma emanating good and evil from his body, I want to take that into Persic mythology, which probably has done more with the ideas of good and evil than all of the other mythologies put together. I want to go into the Zend Avesta and look at some of those things. Other things I intend to do are rabbinical tales, and I have uh, one or two very engaging Native American stories, uh, really simple, but deceptively simple for what they have to say about how evil came into the world, and we'll get to that eventually. Uh, now, we've gotten rid of two introductions. Now we have only uh, one and a half more to go. And uh, we'll be all done for tonight. I'm not a Bible scholar, nor an authority or an expert in any sense on the Bible. In fact, I am not highly inclined toward the Bible. I believe in a non-biblical, or in some ways, a non-scriptural spirituality. That we're coming to the times when we are supposed to see things in the spiritual worlds with nothing between us and those spiritual truths. What we're going to do, though, is what we're, we're going to use the King James Version. I happen to have a Masonic version of the King. It's just the King James Bible with a few other pages added in, not within the Bible text itself. And uh, the reason I'm, there are several reasons why we're going to take the King James Version. One of them is it's probably more familiar and more available than most other translations. There are other modern translations of, that are readily available, but I refuse to use them altogether because what happens is they are simplified, that all of the truth is simplified out of them. Because there are a lot of quirky things in Bible passages that are not really straightforward. And... Uh, they are difficult to read because they start you thinking and they seem so uh, out of place within the text of the scripture. And that's their primary purpose or their meaning is because those are places that are outlets from the scripture into the truth. And because they're so awkward and difficult to deal with, modern translators uh, take and they just smooth everything over. They make it a smooth and easy road and they, uh, they don't listen to Einstein. Einstein said, make it as simple as you can, but no more. Because if you do any more, you take away from the truth. And so we're going to get, a, get away from that. And another problem with a lot of translations of the Bible is that they assume modern theological ideas and modern doctrines of Christianity, and those doctrines and theological outlooks are put right into the uh, right into the translation. 
and uh, it turns out to be not maybe not what was intended in the first place by the uh, writers of the Bible or by the writers of a myth. And uh, that's, that's a very difficult thing. And the attitude is, a uh, uh, wag that I know said it this way, he said, if English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, and uh, a lot of people have that kind of notion that, uh, I don't know, they, prob- they would probably watch Jesus on television now. Almost all myths and almost all scriptures of all religions of all time were written down by mystics or by secretaries to mystics when the mystics were too otherworldly. But they were written by people who were in touch with the spiritual material. They were not written by novelists and they were not written by tedious scholars or historians or anything like that. They were written by people who knew because they experienced the truth. So that is, uh, you know, so it's filled, the, the writings are filled with spiritual content. The Bible has been compromised many times. People uh, change Outlooks change, and sometimes uh, it is not politically advantageous for church people to have a truth be too evident. So it's easier to change the scripture than it is to uh, live to the truth. There are really good translations available, and one of the more ironic things is is that one of the best translations available comes from the Moody Bible Institute. And the Moody Bible Institute is very, very conservative and fundamentalistic, the people that are there. But the scholars had enough integrity so so that when they translated, they translated according to their integrity and they figured that, you know, it's sort of like uh, in politics. You know, it took a Republican to open up China. It took Richard Nixon, who was a Republican, to open up China because he was so convinced and confirmed in his uh, conservatism that he thought he couldn't be hurt by it. Whereas, you know, uh, if if a Democrat had done it, it was all those pinko liberals, you know, they're selling us out to communism. And uh, in a similar fashion, uh, the people at the Moody Bible Institute, because they were so convinced or confirmed in their spiritual conservatism, they felt that they could translate the Bible and say it as with full integrity as they saw it, what it said, and they knew that their people would not be led astray because they were really firmly uh, uh, confirmed. Um, another reason for the King James Bible is because it has some pretty pretty and uh, lovely uh, uh, prose in it. It isn't sing-song and nicey nice, you know, it's like a child's Sunday school thing all the way through. And despite all of the compromises uh, that the Bible has gone through over the centuries, the uh, King James Version is some ways improved in its mystical content. Uh, Apparently, it was in the hands of Francis Bacon exclusively for a year before it was released. After all the translators got finished with it, Francis Bacon had it alone for a year. And you can be sure that uh, he made certain that all of the mystical things were not taken out. Difficulties with the uh, Bible are that they were written in languages that are unlike the modern languages. Hebrew especially is one of those languages that has... The same passage has many, many valid translations. That differences in punctuation, differences in the way you break the words, and what vowels you put into the places where vowels get put in make completely different translations. I don't know uh, if there is a translation that gives all the possible ways that a given passage could be uh, 
translated. I don't know if there is such a one. I think if you looked at several sources, you might be able to find it. But what happens is that in the process of translating, some things sound so ridiculous that some people think, no, that couldn't possibly be what it means. You know what I mean? And uh, especially when you get to very ancient and very deep spiritual things, like a lot of the Vedic things, the consciousness of humanity was so different then, and they're dealing with things that it's, it's almost like if you follow a poet uh, throughout the poet's life, the poet will start following a line of symbolism that gets further and further and further out so that somebody off the street just picking up the symbol, picking up the poem, wouldn't make any sense to them. But if you follow the history of the person, you can see what they're, what they're pointing to. And uh, it was like that all the time. Everything that was in the Vedas uh, is very hard to read because it, it's, it's way out there. And so some of those things that sound like they're really ridiculous and uh, uh, silly, uh, we talked about it at one time, one of the oldest things that has been with the mysteries from the most ancient Vedas to a Midsummer Night's Dream is uh, in, the, in the ancient Vedas, I believe it's Travastar, cuts the head off of a horse and puts it on to someone else, which is the same theme as taking an ass's head and putting it on bottom of the weaver in a Midsummer Night's Dream, which was celebrated in Elysius where the mysteries are celebrated. And so, uh, of all those possible translations, some of them don't get written down because they seem so absurd, and we may never have some of them unless we go to the original language itself. In order to understand scripture, or in order to understand myth, it can only be done with intuition. One must give up a lot of pet ideas, and must give up even looking at the words themselves and feel what is behind them. And uh, if you don't think that works, I can tell you uh, one of the most amazing things I saw in my life. I started computer programming about 20, 27 years ago. And I worked with a man who was an intuitive computer programmer. And literally there would be code written in machine language, which is just a whole bunch of funny uh, consonants put together, and this was telling the computer what to do under this circumstance, under this circumstance. And it was very complicated code, and it's very difficult without taking and stepping through it step by step by step. It takes hours to do that to catch an error. And do you know how this man debugged his code? He ran his hands over it, just like a modern uh, masseuse or masseur runs the hands over the body looking for a spot where, there is, where it's too hot or where it's too cold and uh, where they can feel that there's a weakness going on. He went right over computer code. I couldn't believe it. He went over computer code. He said, ah, there's something wrong right in here. And I was utterly astounded. Here, I was the one that was studying mysticism. And uh, he was debugging computer code in that same way. Um, one has to use intuition because, taking the Bible, neither the Old Testament nor the New Testament claims to be an open book. Both of them, in several places, say that they are closed books. And they even say, give warnings not to to take them literally, that one has to read between the lines or has to see what is behind. So this is not going we're going to, we're going to go pretty intricately to some scripture, but it's not meant to be uh, scriptural scholarship because I just am not, that's just not me and I don't want to be a scriptural scholar. Jakob Bema probably was uh, one of the better uh, kickoff people for modern Western mysticism in that his claim was as beautiful as the Bible is and as filled as it is with truth, it should be set aside. That the time has come 
that we should live our lives in such a manner that our living and our life penetrates into the spiritual worlds and that we see them directly. And uh, even he knew the whole Bible almost by heart, but he thought that was the way to go about it. And uh, that is the way that we're going to try and do it. We're going to try and uh, drop the uh, casing or drop the forms of the stories and get the spiritual meanings behind. We've mentioned some of these things before, but I'll just bring them back to review. There is nothing wrong with the works such as the works of Joseph Campbell or Marie Louise von Franz or other Jungians or other symbolists, but those are not the approaches that we are going to take. To quote Carl Jung himself, it's from the uh, volume on the uh, psychological types. Carl Jung says the only reason that a symbol is necessary at all in human experience is because we have a partition between our outward material conscious, consciousness and our inward unconscious. If this partition were not there, symbolism would not be necessary. Now, because Carl Jung was exceedingly shy and reserved about mysticism to such a degree that he was hostile and uh, absurd in some of his criticisms of theosophy and anthroposophy, for example, he maintained, and for good reasons, for his own good reasons, he maintained that the partition between the outer material consciousness and the inner unconsciousness was necessary. And that to penetrate through that partition meant insanity. Mysticism looks at it very differently. The mystic would say that dissolving the partition or dissolving the veil is not only desirable, but it is mandatory. That we cannot live as divided and partitioned people where we have one kind of consciousness and one kind of life outwardly and another inwardly. It's not just enough to have a symbol through which there is communication between the two parts of our being. Mysticism would agree to some extent with Carl Jung in saying that it is very necessary that as we do the things to wear down or begin to penetrate through the veil, that we do so very slowly, very carefully, and only with a high degree of humility and with a good deal of love or insanity is not only possible, but probable. If we have a healthy amount of egoism, insanity is almost a verity if we take away the veil. Jung was also right in saying that there is a good deal of difference between the consciousness within and the consciousness without. And not only must we be humble and slow and careful in trying to turn inward, when we do turn inward, we have to let go of the kind of consciousness that we express in the material world and learn a different kind of consciousness. Because what we are intended to be, or were intended to be, as spiritual beings, and the nature of the spiritual worlds is different. We can't talk about it the way we talk about automobile parts. 
The best statement I've ever heard about that is by Meister Eckhart when he says, one does not see God with the same eye with which one sees a cow. Uh, <laughs> that it has to be something other. Learning that other kind of consciousness can only happen as we, with great effort, with great patience, and with great love, cultivate an inner life. And the more we cultivate that inner life, the more we see things in a different way, and the more differently we conduct our own lives. It's very hard to put into words because our words are so much of the material world, but uh, those are very, those are truly what, uh, what, what one has to do. Now something happens that is very ironic and exceedingly humiliating to me, that after having said all of that, it must be evident that even after years of work, I don't live directly enough. I don't love enough so that I can sing from the world of truth or that I can fly from out of the cage and uh, speak directly. And so the thoughts are a very painful thing to me. Uh, as much as they're fun, they're painful because every time I just realize how much I don't uh, live all of this. So, we're going to spend the entire hour. I never thought it would go that long. St. Paul said something to the effect, it was a theme that came up several times, he said, well, I wanted to write to you about spiritual things, but because you love, uh, because you live the way you live, I couldn't talk to you of spiritual things, and I have to talk to you of hard things. <laughs> and for me, uh, it turns out to be the other way. I wanted to talk to you about spiritual things, but because I live the life I do, uh, it isn't going to be quite be that way. All right. That means that the talks themselves are going to be something like myths. Maybe they'll be a little bit thinner than normal myths. Most of what we want to uh, be studying for the next few weeks is in the third chapter of Genesis. I'll read the third chapter of Genesis or try to do so. Um, it begins... Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God, God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Well, hath not God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall sure, not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of, Lo, of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife 
hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me, gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Right away, put in the blame, right away. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. It's a real pass along, isn't it? And I did eat. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust art thou, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. Now lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep away, to keep the way of the tree of life. That's what we're going to study for a few weeks, only next time we meet. Uh, we're going to try, there's a lot of assumption in there, and there's a lot of information and a lot of ideas. And so the next time we meet, we're probably going to look at the chapters that precede it, chapters 1 and 2, and then we'll look at chapter 3, in some detail to try and get at some of the very basic ideas of good and evil. And it's astounding how much there is in that when one contemplates it. And then we'll finish up by going as far as uh, chapter 6 uh, to find out what the outcome of evil is or to find the progression of evil, evil from one state to another. And so then if you like read uh, chapter 3 at least 15 times before we get together again. And uh, if you want, you can read 1 and 2 because that's where we're going to spend a lot of time on next time. And hopefully, I don't know that there is time, but uh, 
What would really be nice is since we are looking at what is called a fall from spiritual grace, a fall from the spiritual worlds into materiality, it would be very nice to take the story of the fall or the degradation into more material and more selfish states and then look at the mirror image of that by looking at the path of apotheosis as we rise out of uh, material consciousness and back into spiritual consciousness, but I don't know that we'll have time to do that. Uh, maybe sometime we'll get a chance to do it. So next time, uh, be prepared. We'll try to do a lot of uh, close thinking about the early part of the book of Genesis, and we'll have a lot of fun thinking about it until then. And that's all we have. See, it was all introduction, all preparation, and no real material. Yes? Still thinking about something that you said early on. Okay. To say that John is the uh, gospel of the hearers and Luke is the gospel of the seers seems valid and one will not again say that. But the point of how Luke is emotion and the perspective of the world of desire, uh, I'm not quite sure how the apperception of the truth is from the Luke perspective is giving you that conclusion that this is here. Um, there are several ways you can look at that but if you look at uh, Luke's gospel it has all of those very tearful stories in, the, in it and if you, as you read, at least at least when I do, when I read Luke's Gospel, I see visions and pictures inside of myself, and all of them are very feelingful. Whereas John's Gospel is very clearly philosophical, and you have to think on it a good deal. Uh, it's it is quite abstract. I don't think there are almost I think there are almost no parables in John's Gospel. It's all. Uh, lofty philosophical thought. Uh, eventually, when I get done with mysticism, I want to spend about maybe the rest of my life talking about Christianity. And one of the things I want to do is look at the Gospels relative, uh, look at each of them as a, uh, as a mystery play in itself. That if you're of such and such a nature, that if you work with one gospel, you're more likely to be brought to initiation. They're each formulae for initiation, and they each contain things from the mysteries from all over the Mideast and from, from very ancient times, right within the parables and stories and such like that. And uh, it's all right there, and hopefully I would like to study that. But one perspective on it is that Matthew's Gospel, this is a Steiner perspective, and I think it is a valid one, that Matthew's Gospel is for the physical body, and Mark's is for the etheric body, and that uh, for the desire body uh, is Luke's, and for the mind is John's Gospel. And this is... Uh, you find that all of the parables and, and allegories are much more in Mark and Matthew, and they are there because uh, the consciousness is of a much more materialistic kind, and it can't see things directly but has to use the symbolic uh, framework. Moreover, uh, especially Mark's gospel is the gospel of uh, direct healing, and the direct healing takes place through the uh, etheric body and through the etheric world. And the relationship of the vital body to the physical body is very close. And if you look at any two, go uh, any two of the four Gospels, the two that are closest to each other are Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel, which is, uh, represents the closeness between the physical body and the etheric body of being almost identical to each other, uh, cell for cell, organ for organ, and uh, it is healing is effected through the flows of energy. In fact, the times of the day that uh, the healings take place are times of the day 
when the energies are most fluent in the etheric world. In fact, I think if you look at Mark's Gospel, the, uh, most of the healings take place shortly after sunset. Uh, and that's when most people um, begin to unfold clairvoyance because the ethers are most alive and uh, things shine out easier right after sunset. It stays that way until midnight and they start wearing off again right before sunrise. But uh, uh, like everything from this, to, uh, to more uh, directly answer your question, everything from the story of the spikenard to the uh, ointment to the story of the uh, uh, Annunciation uh, to the uh, shepherds, it is a very feelingful gospel. The proximity of making the statement to the apperception in the world of thought to mm -hmm. the archetypes is where I was getting a little confused. Oh, yes. Uh, the, in John's gospel, the truth is spoken very, very directly in the spirit. And it radiates right to the people that pick it up. And because of that, the language is very unearthly. And this is the one, this is the gospel where the hearers have a hard time saying that you must eat of my body and drink of my blood to be part of me. And the people who heard that took that in an extremely materialistic way. They were taking it in a Matthew's gospel all the way. In fact, the Catholic Church still does. They don't see it as a direct uh, partaking in the worlds of pure spirit and uh, experiencing directly in that way. But that's, that, that is, I think, an example of a direct word or emanation of truth in a way that's almost incomprehensible to the worldly mind, and it, it almost knocks a person over, it's so strong. Yeah. Okay. If there's any more questions, we might even have some information tonight. <laughs> we might even have a talk. Yes? Um, to Adam and Eve's story that uh, you're, you're going to spend um, the first several weeks on the first, first several talks, yes. So um, I'm just curious, where um, where did that myth originate as far as you know, and um, does it change um, over time? So let's say like in the, the church councils and things, did they fiddle with it at all? Or? Uh, I think if there were any changes in that story, they came much earlier that uh, all of what we call the Old Testament, the Bible, especially the older parts of it, uh, were carried as an oral tradition for a very long time before they were written down, before they were put, put as script in the sense of scripture. And if there were any changes, it was likely to have been in those times. Uh, the difficulty with the uh, Adam and Eve story is just as we read it there uh, it talks about very graphic material serpents and everything in it is in very materialistic language and the thing that is you know that to me it's, it's language that is even offensive for what it represents in spirit the language is so materialistic that it uh, takes away or it's, it's almost impossible to get at the meaning and intent behind it because it has been, the changes have been more in the language in which it was put rather than, than, the, than the makeup of the story. Uh, there is also uh, in, uh, how would you say it, in uh, Jewish spirituality, there are, the oral tradition is still alive. And the oral tradition is much more esoteric and it is considerably different from the scriptural tradition. In the uh, scriptural tradition, it is codified. This is it. This is the way it has been for centuries and the form that the religion takes goes from there. 
But the stories, the rabbinical tales, if you can get a book of rabbinical tales that has been written down, they have been carried from, from generation to generation, and they're delightful. They're really quite esoteric in nature. And so uh, of scriptures that are existent in the world, I would say that the Jewish Old Testament has been changed much less, for example, than Christianity, than the Christian uh, uh, Gospels. Uh, you know, at one time there were as many as uh, nine or ten Gospels, and many of them were just uh, uh, claimed to be heretic, and a lot of them were compromised. And occasionally you can find earlier translations where you can see where they were compromised at which stage along the way. No questions. I got one from last night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for sitting through what is a very dry and non-lecture. But now we got it out of the way. Now we're going to have to work really hard because we said we're going to work really hard. What?